Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this maintainer's track session for SIG scheduling. Uh, my name is Aldo Kulki Condor. I work at Google, and I'm a TL uh, in the SIG. So I'm Kensei from Merukari, Japan. Uh, I'm, I'm the approver in SIG scheduling. So uh, we're going to start uh, with an overview of uh, the scheduler, I guess, the, it's, which is the main project within uh, our SIG. Uh, so we'll talk about the basics of it. We'll also talk about what's been happening in the past, um, the past year. And then we'll move on into sub-project updates. As a SIG, yes, the scheduler is our main pro project. But we have, uh, let's call them incubating or, or mature projects that we are also working on, such as the, uh, the, the scheduler WASM extension, Q, the descheduler, and more, more recently, uh, Quark. Um, so we're going to go through all of these ones. Uh, but let's start with scheduler. Um, and uh, this is an overview of uh, the multiple steps that the scheduler uh, executes in order to assign one pod to a node. Uh, the, the, the computation for each pod is uh, split in two stages. First, uh, scheduling cycle, uh, the green box, the, green, the big green box, um, which happens serially. So every pod that goes through the scheduler will go through this box in a serial manner. And then we have the binding cycle, uh, which uh, basically handles the communication with API server. And this can be parallelized. Uh, um, so it happens like that. Um, but overall, like, um, the scheduler is built in a way that we can uh, modularize it uh, to implement different um, mechanics, different uh, scheduling attributes. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can say uh, the most the most basic scheduling um, parameter is whether or not your your node is full, right? So that's a yes or no decision, uh, or what we call a filter. Um, so you, based on the the total uh, allocatable capacity of your node. A pod comes in, and you just answer yes or no. Does it fit? Does it not fit? Uh, and of course, we have multiple APIs that define different behaviors, like uh, affinities, not affinity, pod affinity, uh, topology spreading, and so on and so forth. Uh, but all of these uh, uh, filters define a, uh, give a yes or no uh, answer. And uh, further. We, once we have a set of candidate nodes where the pod can be scheduled, we uh, do a scoring uh, based on different criteria. It could be similar criteria. Uh, and for each, for each node, we calculate a number that tells us how good is it to put this pod in this node. Um, and that's the this, this scoring phase. So those are the main uh, extension points for the scheduler. but. Uh, once you go into the weeds, there's so many uh, things you can tweak. So we have a few different extension points. Um, also, more, uh, more recently, we introduced uh, a new extension point, which is even farther uh, on, the left, on the left side, the uh, purple box, uh, which is what we call the pre-in-Q. Uh, the pre-in-Q um, allows us to make decisions even before we consider the pod for, for scheduling. Uh, uh, the, the, most, um, the most important feature here uh, that uses this, uh, this semantics is the scheduling gates, which simply allows, uh, it simply allows uh, us to hold the pod from scheduling until some other controller says yes or no. Um, so you could have, for example, a quota manager, a quota manager that decides whether or not the pod is ready to be scheduled, uh, or well, other other uh, extension or other mechanisms to decide. So that's uh, that's where we are today with the scheduler. Uh, 
So from here, we will introduce the recent improvements in command scheduler. So the first one is a new feature called match double keys in pot affinity and pot anti affinity. So match double keys specifies the keys for the doubles uh, that should match with the incoming pot doubles. So actually, we introduced the same feature in pot topology spread recently. And the biggest, biggest use case here is that uh, to like improve the calculation accuracy during the rolling upgrades of uh, deployment. So let's see how it works with the example. So we have a deployment with a re required pod affinity. This pod affinity requires pods to be in the same zone. And let's see how it works if you don't have uh, much level kids. So run rolling upgrade for this deployment. So the desired, out desired outcome here is that all ports from the new versions, uh, new version are placed in the same zone. But the scheduler takes both old and new ports into consideration during uh, port affinity calculation. So the new ports could be like scheduled in both zones because we have uh, ports in both zones before. So new, it's, it's gonna be like, this, this, this. So it could end up uh, having only one pod in a zone, which we don't want to. So let's use the math level keys here to, uh, with pod template hash. Uh, so pod template hash is the level key which all pods from the deployment have. Uh, the value of pod, temper pod template hash is different, different between each version. So we can make the scheduler take only the same version's pods into the consideration during the calculation. So let's see again. Uh, the scheduler would ignore the old version's pods, so only sees the orange ones, which is new ones. Cool. So the results should always be like all, all, the, all, all orange pods are pressed in the same zone. So the next one, uh, so at the same time, we introduced mismatch level keys, which sounds very similar. Uh, mismatch level keys specifies the keys for the levels that should not match with the, with the, with the incoming pods levels. So let's see one use case to understand how it works. So this pod have uh, pod affinity and pod anti affinity. Pot affinity endures this pot goes to node pool, which already have, which already has pots from the same tenant, and pot anti affinity endures this pot goes to node pool, which does not have pots from different tenants. So I mean, like, let's say this pot is in tenant A, then this pot cannot go to node pool, which already has pots from like tenant B. Uh, this combination makes it possible to achieve that uh, pods go to node pool, which has only pods from the same tenant, and all pods from the same tenant are scheduled in the same node pool. The last one we introduce is queuing hint. So before getting into it, uh, I have to describe like uh, background, background knowledge of it about how, in general, how pods are moved in the scheduler. So let's see this example. Uh, we created we, we create a pod with a required pod affinity. When any pods are created, the scheduler notices such like newly created pods via event handler and put the such newly created pods into scheduling queue. So scheduling queue is composed of three places: uh, active queue back of queue and unschedulable pop pool. Uh, basically, it, uh, like new, new recreated pods uh, put into active queue first, unless pre and queue rejects it. Then the scheduler takes pods from the active queue one by one and schedule them. Yeah. So in this example, the scheduler cannot find any nodes which satisfy pot affinity. So as we described, uh, so each like each scheduling constraint is uh, implemented as a plugin. So in this case, pod affinity plugin rejects this pod uh, because it's there. Is, there are no place to like no place satisfy the pod affinity of this pod. 
So such rejected ports are basically put in the uh, unschedulable port pool. As I emphasize basically, uh, there are some exceptions, but we, like, we don't have uh, time uh, to get into such detail. Uh, and yes, uh, so at the same time, uh, at this time, the scheduling queue remembers which plugins uh, rejected each pod. Uh, so this rejected plugin will be used during uh, requeuing process in scheduling queue, which is by queuing hint. There we go. So queuing hint is a callback function per plugin uh, to decide when to requeue, when to retry these pods. Uh, so the scheduler keeps watching what happened in the cluster via event handler, and queuing hint from rejected plugins are like called every time some events happen. So in this example, a pod affinity is the failure of this uh, of like this this pod encountered. Uh, so the uh, scheduling queue uses queuing hint from pod affinity plugin and like decide when to requeue this pod. Uh, so it makes sense because uh, this pod is rejected by pod affinity uh, in a like last scheduling cycle. So in other words, uh, this pod will never be schedulable until pod affinity failure is resolved somehow. And queuing hint is the way to know when it's resolved. So via uh, queuing hint, we aim to avoid having wasteful scheduling cycles as much as possible by like retrying the scheduling smartly. So back to this example. So let's think about how um, pod affinity failure could uh, could be resolved. So one possible scenario is that an existing pod gets uh, like new rubble value, which matches with this uh, unschedulable uh, unscheduled pod's pod affinity. So to cover this scenario, uh, pod affinity has a queuing hint for pod updated event, and when the queuing hint finds like such events, uh, the scheduling queue requeues uh, this pod into active queue or back of queue, and the scheduler will retry the scheduling of the of the pod. This is how uh, queuing hint works in general. So we are actively working on this queuing in queuing hint enhancements recently. So we started the deployment of this uh, queuing hint in 1.28, and uh, some entry plugins uh, supported queuing hints in 1.29, next release. Yep, so we will see other notable updates. So we introduced skip status in pre-future and pre-score uh, to avoid execution of corresponding future and score. So for example, when pods does not have any like pod affinity requirement, then pod affinity plugin can return skip in pre-filter and the scheduler won't execute uh, like pod, affin uh, pod affinity plugin in future phase. Also, uh, scheduler configuration v one bait 3 is removed in 1.29, so please move your configuration to v one Yep, so from here, we are gonna like talk about the uh, no, uh, sub-project updates. The first one is Wasma extension. So it's uh, quite new uh, sub-project in SQL scheduling. Uh, it's an experimental extension to build scheduling plugins uh, on like uh, WebAssembly. So we may uh, you, you may hear uh, Wasm around the web browser, but actually it started to be used not only in the browser but also in the like backend side to provide some extendability. So yeah, let's see how it works. Like uh, this project have uh, this project has uh, Goran SDK, which allows people to develop plugins in a like very similar experience uh, to Goran existing Goran scheduler plugins. So on the SDK, you just need to implement the interface like this example, and you can like compile it into Wasm binary by following uh, just following. Uh, instructions. And you can enable your Wasm plugin via the scheduler configuration like this, and you have to pass the like file path to the binary and just enable it. 
so when you want to bring your own logic into the scheduler, uh, you probably implement your own like Golang scheduler plugins nowadays. Uh, this is the mo most popular way, and we also have another like webhook based extension called Extender, um, but it's not as popular as the Golang scheduler program because it's less performant and less extendable. So not only in the scheduler, but uh, Kubernetes, community, uh, Kubernetes itself has like several extensions in several components. So usually uh, extensions are provided via like webhooks or like Golang plugin stuff, like the ex extender and Golang scheduler plugins in scheduler. So However, those uh, come with like some drawbacks, uh, performance concern on extender or like need to review your components, your scheduler and replace schedulers with uh, like your goal and plugins. So Watson based extension could be a solution to these challenges. So it allows users to build plugins without worrying about like recompiling, re replacing and uh, like it also performed better than web based uh, solutions. Uh, so yes, I personally I personally believe uh, what's my extension would be uh, like big step not only for us. I mean not for only for six scheduling, but also for Quantis community to explore like the possibility of extension via Wasm. But on the other hand, there are some disadvantages, disadvantages from Wasm. So the first one is latency impact. So as I said, it's actually much, much faster than extenders, like a web, web-based uh, extension, but uh, still slower than the Golang scheduler plugins, obviously, because it needs to go through Wasm, Wasm runtime. So we suppose it will not uh, like replace uh, existing scheduler plugins eventually because if you have a very large cluster, uh, the performance of scheduler is super crucial and the, like, this latency impact may not be okay for your cluster, your huge cluster. Yes, another one is what some peculiar limitations, but uh, we, we don't have time to get into like detail here, but hope, hopefully uh, we will have some chance to share knowledge around this. So talking about the current status, it's an, as I said, early stage and there are many things to do. Uh, actually, it only supports the common extension points such as uh, pre-filter, filter, pre-score and score. And we'd like to see all extension points supported as soon as possible. So, and yeah, uh, but we currently have some like exa example implementation of Watson based plugins in the repository. So you, want, you can go and see what happens there. The next project uh, is uh, I want, we wanted to highlight is Q. This is probably at the moment one of the biggest projects in SIG scheduling. Uh, other than the scheduler, of course. Um, what, is, what is this offering? So it, you can think of Q as a second level scheduler that takes decisions at the job level. Uh, and the decisions are uh, whether or not uh, a particular uh, application, a particular team has enough quota to run their, uh, to run their job. Uh, so uh, it takes decisions at the job level as opposed to the pod level, like the scheduler. Um, so we can uh, um, we, we can um, take queuing decisions uh, independently of the size of the job. Um, so it's a it's a resource quota manager uh, to offer. Um, some flexibility around uh, the quota management. It offers to a two-level hierarchy uh, so that you can define uh, fair sharing and borrowing semantics. Um, and once you uh, define borrowing, you might also want to do preemption. And the preemption here happens at the job level as opposed to uh, preempting in the individual pods. Uh, 
Also core, very core to the design of Q is uh, fungibility, uh, which m maybe not everybody is familiar with the term, but it's, uh, it's the ability to burst from one type of resource into another, uh, which could be uh, different levels of uh, availability, like you could have reservations or on-demand VMs or uh, uh, spot VMs. Or if we are talking, for example, about uh, accelerators, maybe you have different models and you want to run on uh, the newest Chinese GPU, but you are okay running in, a, in another model. So all these semantics can be defined in Q. Uh, again, Q works at the job level, uh, so we need to understand particular APIs. Uh, we already support the job API, the Kubernetes native job API, uh, as well as uh, a newer API in SIG apps, which is Jobset. And we also support all of Kubeflow, uh, Kuberay uh, through, through RayJob, and more recently, PlainPods. Um, and because not everybody brands like this standard or well-known CRDs, we also uh, support, we have a library so you can extend support for uh, any CRDs. And we also added more recently a, a new mechanism to in, uh, inject extra decisions about whether or not a job can be admitted. So I want to give a quick overview of uh, all the components, how all how Q and scheduler and other components talk to each other, how and how it fits in a batch system. Uh, first of all, uh, on the top, on the on the left, you have uh, a cluster administrator or a cluster operator. Uh, they define how many, how much resources can each tenant of the cluster have, right? So they would define uh, what we call flavors, which is which resources you have, and uh, queues, which will have the quotas. And on the other hand, you have a researcher that probably is not familiar with all the, the, the internals of Kubernetes. They just want to run jobs. So they have all their backlog of jobs. Uh, and the, the, the journey for them is very simple. They just create a job, which could be, a, again, a Kubernetes job, a Kubeflow job, uh, so on and so forth. So. That comes into the API server. Q reacts to it. Q takes a, a quota uh, level, a, a quota uh, decision, um, a quota based decision, decides whether or not to admit the job. Uh, it looks at the resource flavors. If uh, there is quota in a particular resource flavor, then it will inject uh, node affinities associated to this flavor so that the scheduler can later uh, pay attention to these uh, node labels and place the pods in that particular flavor. Uh, so that's step two. Um, here is where the new, uh, the new features come in, 2.1 and 2.2, the highlighted with asterisks on red. Um, uh, we added this uh, external admission checks logic or admission check extensions, uh, which pr uh, give us the ability to control um, uh, have uh, give the control of admission to other controllers. Um, one of th such controllers could be is the cluster autoscaler. Uh, so, um, if if you uh, your cloud provider supports uh, this API, uh, which in the cluster autoscaler is called the provisioning request API, uh, if they support this API, you are able to allow uh, you are able to request a bulk a bulk of resources from the cloud provider. So you can say, uh, I have 10, uh, 10 or 100 or 1,000 pods with this shape. Can you uh, provide them? Um, so we use, Q is able to use this uh, API for your job and it will request the, the scale up. And once the cloud service scaler responds, yes, I, have, I, I made the scale up, we can proceed with the rest uh, of, the, of the process. Um, on the lower side, 2.2, uh, we have these external checks. You can define your own custom external checks. You could, for example, implement budgets. Uh, uh, we are thinking of implementing multi-clusters through, through this extension mechanism. Uh, multiple things you can, you can do. Um, so that's 2.2. Now we have decided the job can run. Great. 
Uh, so what does this mean? This means that uh, now at this point, the job controller or the queue flow controller uh, is able to decide, is able to create pods. Uh, so these job controllers go and create pods. And up to this point, we haven't, uh, we haven't used uh, much etcd um, storage. Only at this point, we, when we, once we know that the job can run, we create all these pods. Um, and once we have the pods, kubescaler can do its usual tasks and assign a, a node to each of these pods. And if you didn't have the provisioning request uh, support, your cluster autoscaler can still scale up uh, if necessary. So as you can see, Q doesn't replace any of the existing components. It's a, it's a higher level scheduler, or what we like to call it a, Q, uh, a, a queuing system. Uh, that place and um, you can plug into your existing cluster and you can even use uh, other uh, schedulers with uh, Q. So um, quickly, because I'm running out of time, these are the, the things that are in our mind for, for the next releases. We just did a release two weeks ago, um, but we are thinking of uh, uh, more visibility group uh, uh, support for pods, so groups of pods as opposed to single pods, uh, more policies for requeuing, um, also hierarchies. We have a two-level hierarchy. Uh, our users are asking for higher levels. Uh, we are thinking of multi-cluster uh, and uh, workflows. Uh, we don't want to implement workflows in queue. Again, uh, there are many uh, great workflow managers like Argo, um, Tekton, or uh, Qflow pipelines so on and so forth, snake make. They, they do their job great. We want that to work with Q, uh, as opposed to Q having to re-implement all that logic. Um, another project uh, we have in Cube Scheduler is uh, the D Scheduler, which is, as its name suggests, is kind of the opposite. Uh, you have uh, lots of running pods. Um, now you have certain policies for when these pods needs to be evicted. Um, so in the new version of, uh, of this scheduler 0.28, they also follow uh, a similar model to the scheduler where they have a descaler framework. So uh, more people, more contributors can contribute plugins to the descaler to implement different policies. Um, in this new version, they uh, have guarantees that they have two types of plugins, balance and deschedule, and they have the guarantees that the balance, balance plugins will run before all the deschedule plugins, and some bug fixes on the V2, V1 alpha 2 API. Um, right now, they, in the last two releases, they got nine, uh, 29 contributors, so it's pretty exciting to see. Um, so this is the descheduler framework. It has some resemblance of the scheduler, um, but what I want to highlight here is that there is these two, uh, in this example, there are two profiles. Uh, you can have as many different profiles. Uh, and within, the, a prof, within a profile, you can have uh, these scheduled plugins and balanced plugins. What is these scheduled plugins? Very simple things. Um, they take a decision for one pod at a time. For example, you can have a simple policy such as TTL after X minutes, you want this, the pods to stop. Uh, that's a, this, a, a simple example of a descheduled plugin. On the other hand, you can have a balanced plugin which takes decisions for groups of pods. For example, if you want to maintain high availability, you probably want to uh, maintain certain level of, um, of homogeneity between different zones, right? So one, uh, you can implement a plugin to uh, define the semantics, or the descaler already has these these plugins as well. Um, next, I think this, yeah, this is the last uh, sub project. Quark uh, also quite new, uh, but already 2K uh, GitHub stars, which is a lot, uh, given the the time that it's been um, going for. Uh, what is this? Uh, so we have all these this, uh, scheduling uh, 
projects, how do we measure the performance of them? How do we simulate before we go into production? How do we, how do, we do simulations of all these scheduling semantics? Um, so this is where Quark comes in. Quark is, it, its name means uh, Kubernetes without Kubelet. So basically, it's a controller that uh, simulates what Kubelet would do if all these pods existed, um, all these nodes existed. So we can uh, easily run, for example, a 10,000 uh, 10, nodes simulation in a single, in, in one laptop. Um, you don't have to create a, a big cluster, a big real cluster, but you get as close as possible to a real cluster. You still have health checks and uh, all this extra load on the API server from the kubelets, uh, and pods can start and can finish. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of feedback in the past uh, in the past past months, and uh, some some highlights. Uh, the, there is. Uh, um, some support through through CRDs for configuration. Um, Quark and run, Quark is is deployable in a single image, um, and now it's recently uh, Quark supports Podman, so you can run Quark anywhere, pretty much Docker, Podman, NetCTL, or even as a binary in your laptop, like directly on on your laptop. Um, Support for snapshot and restore through Quark CTL. Um, um, yes, and what is coming next? Um, some usage simulation for CPU memory and extra um, extra commands through Quark CTL. So uh, lots of projects. Uh, I hope we didn't overwhelm you too much. But now we have some minutes for questions. Is there a mic? I can repeat. Ah, there's a microphone right there. And you're right. Thanks for your presentation. Um, one question you mentioned, you have the concept for job sets. Uh, can I use it together with uh, MPI jobs, uh, build a job set from MPI jobs, for example? Yes, so that is, well, that's, this is SIG apps domain. Uh, although I, I'm fairly familiar with job set, uh, the idea of job set is that you can define a job with multiple templates, uh, and you can define some networking for these pods. So yes, you can use it to implement a MPI jobs. At the moment, there are some complications because in MPI you need you need all this uh, what is. Uh, you, need, you need the hostname file, right? That mm -hmm. contains all the names of all the pods. Uh, so that's something that you probably will have to do it yourself. Uh, job set by itself doesn't provide you with so that. I cannot test currently the Kubeflow MPI job kind of thing. Uh, so Kubeflow solves, solves all of this already. Mm -hmm. uh, but only for one template. So you can have actually, well, two templates, the driver and the workers, but you only have one shape of workers. So yes, you can, Qflow already supports all of that. So um, that's out of the box. Uh, Jobset tries to go a little bit beyond, but MPI is, it's tricky. <laughs> oh, okay. um, yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I don't know if this is something that's supported in job sets, but is there going to be any uh, support for like being able to consider a group of jobs to be uh, handled by the queue, I think it was? So I think in your example, like you can consider like a single job, but if, uh, if we had some conditions for like, I want to schedule a group of jobs and I only want them to be scheduled if all of them can be scheduled or, or some conditions like that, for example? Like, is there any? Um, job set is, a, is about creation. So it all, what, all it does is create pods based on the templates. Uh, scheduling is still in the scheduler side and queue. So queue, queue knows how to take into account the entire size of the job set. 
uh, so that it can make the decision for the job set. Uh, the scheduler would still take individual uh, decisions for each of the pods, but there is an open there is an open cap and still an open issue to implement cost scheduling. We have the cost scheduling plugin in another sub project, needs to, which needs to be graduated and brought back upstream. But yeah, the, all these pieces, we are trying to make them. Uh, uh, supported all the way through, but we are still on the way. I think we are. Yep. Out of time. We have, okay, we're out of time. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.